Welcome everybody to the second series of documentary photography at NYU. Uh, this time we have hosted a, a round table on uh, collectives of photography, which is a theme that's really uh, important nowadays in order to uh, organize uh, work in a time where the economic, the financial crisis is really affecting uh, photography as everything. Uh, so today we have organized uh, a meeting uh, with two collectives. One is Cesura, founded in 2008. The, uh, the group is, was uh, composed of Ariana Arcara, who sits here, Gabriele Michalizzi, Andy Rocchelli, Alessandro Sala, and Luca Santese, who's present here. And uh, they founded the, um, the collective because they wanted to produce independent photographic projects, which is one of the themes we'll be discussing today. And from Terra Project, we have two sitting here on, on the podium, and it's uh, uh, Rocco Rorannelli and Simone Donati. And we have another one hiding in the audience, uh, but he will uh, be asking questions probably. And the Terra Project uh, started in uh, 2006, so maybe from the first groups, uh, collectives that formed in Italy. And um, they uh, tried to experiment uh, a production of uh, works that is more like uh, a collective, we, we can compare it to collective writing, which means like they produce work with all together without a separation or a distinction, but let's uh, listen what they have to say to us. So welcome to uh, Terra Project and Cesura. Thank you. Hello to everybody, and I'm Rocco. I'm part of Terra Project. Uh, before we start, I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers to, you know, of inviting us and giving us a chance to talk about photojournalism, documentary photography, and what are collectives, what, are, what is their role today in the photo world. Uh, just a brief introduction on what is a collective, because maybe not all of you are um, uh, not knowledgeable on this uh, topic. Um, so, a, in a general term, a collective is a group of individuals who decide to work together and to uh, collaborate in a horizontal uh, manner. Uh, this uh, is a great advantage compared to, for example, uh, a hierarchical structure like an agency, where there is a director, where there are some sales re representatives, where are some secretaries, where there is a big uh, organization be behind, with, um, which can lead to uh, loss of re resources, you know, to, to the fact that in a period of crisis like we are facing now, uh, you have to maintain a big group of people working for you. In a collective instead, uh, all members share all the issues, all the topics, all the matters that uh, involve the group, which means that all of us, uh, and then there are also differences, but all of us will be say, uh, salespersons or uh, answering to emails or keeping track of the uh, social uh, networks and, and things like this. Um, although it's a, uh, a collective is a form of uh, photo agency, let's say, which is recently seeing uh, a fresh uh, input from you know, new members, it is kind of an old uh, um, uh, way of thinking, photography, away from the uh, classic authorship uh, manner. Uh, the first uh, major uh, collective was born maybe in the US. There's no, let's say, real history of collectives, but by you know, studying a little bit, reading a little bit, you, you see that the first one was the Photo League, which was born in the 30s in the US which was grouping professional photographers and amateur photographers. And they had a very political um, idea behind. So there was a, a structure which was uh, to f um, offer photos to the media which were more leftist, you know, more leftish than uh, the photos that were 
on average, uh, being, you know, being f uh, founded by agencies. So they had, let's say, a, a political role uh, in the uh, photo world at the time. Uh, after this, the Farm Security Administration, which was instead a, a governmental project, had the idea of documenting the US, you know, the territory, <coughs> the people, the landscape of the country. Um, in order to produce an archive. So there was also, in, in, in this case, there was an idea behind, but it was more of a create, you know, creating uh, a big database of images. Um, we, as uh, Terra Project and, and Cesura, share uh, similar um, structures and similar, uh, maybe, philosophy of uh, um, division of labor, uh, we also have differences. And so today I think we'll talk about this. We'll talk about our uh, works and how we produce them, uh, which are for us uh, the main um, roles of photographers within the collective, which is the role of the collective uh, in general. So uh, next, Ch Cesura will talk about uh, the work and then we'll come back to present some of the work of their project. So, Arianna. Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. Is, is OK? OK. Um, I will do a brief introduction on how Cesura works. So, basically, as Alessandra was saying, we were born in 2008, so six, six, year, six years ago. Um, our story is connected to a Magnum photographer, actually. We started to work for him as assistant, and uh, his name is Alex Maioli, he's an Italian magnum photographer. And basically, after a couple of years, we decided under his art direction to build what's Cesura now, no? So, Cesura basically was uh, born, yeah, six years ago by five people that get together, and basically was kind of uh, uh, trying to put all the, uh, you know, uh, five person with, let's say we were really at the start and so we weren't prepared to go like to present ourselves to an agency. So it was kind of trying to put all together our work and share the ideas and the project. So we started under Alex and right now uh, after six years Chisura is divided in the three main uh, branch. So it's like we have Cesura Lab, which is a part of the studio that works on exhibition, is curating project, and we actually have a, a print lab, a professional print lab. Then we have another part, which is Cesura Educational, which takes care of um, workshop and you know talks like this one. We do it in our studio or outside, and then we have Cesura Publish. The, the, the base of, the, 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 of Cesura is photography, so we produce photo project. Then we work together as a group, we do common project or a um, single one, it depends, we decide it every time uh, on each day on what to work on. And after a couple of years, we also decided to open a publishing house, an independent publishing house that actually publish just project <coughs> from Cesura. Right now, it's just close to Cesura. So, and this is all the point around independence, you know? Uh, it's a way for us to don't have like uh, compromise with the market, the industry, or let's say with the editorial part of the work of a photographer. So we will present today to you um, a project which is called Found Photos in Detroit, made by, by me and uh, Luca which was first of all an exhibition and then uh, a book published under Cesura Publish. And uh, it's kind of interesting for us to show it to you because we can talk about how a photographer actually can, it's a project based on found photos that we found in Detroit. So we went there actually to uh, take picture of the city and to talk of the economic crisis and then we started to found this material on the street. So the project totally changed during this period, so maybe Luca can talk yeah, a bit you about it. You start to tell us everything about the project. <laughs> hey, good evening. Yes, as Ariana said, we, um, uh, we want to show you in particular this kind of um, project because it's a little bit different of normal collective project. Uh, what I mean with normal? The, the, the first thing is that we found this material. This photograph and documents inside this book 
uh, are not material that uh, are not photographs that we take, but we found this, uh, all this material in the street. Everything was was born in 2009. We decided to go to Detroit because we saw this magazine, Time magazine cover uh, that was showing an, uh, a completely different uh, Detroit, uh, a Detroit that was not the you know the metropolis of the car. Uh, uh, a big economy, but uh, a kind of post-apocalyptic city. So we was imme immediately attracted by the city. Uh, we decided to go there and start uh, a project about the city. Um, as we normally did, we start to take pictures and explore the city. But the, the things that happened was that we start to find material, this kind of photograph and documents in the street. Why? Because um, like more or less 50% of the city is in is abandoned. Like 50% um, of the population went away during the crisis. That this crisis was begin uh, it began in the 70s, and, and maybe the end of the crisis was uh, around the, the 90s. So to more or less 20 day, 20 years. And so we start to find this material then uh, at the beginning in front of abandoned houses. The first things that we found was Polaroids, like um, from families' albums or school portraits or picture from church and from schools and from hospitals. Uh, a lot of these different um, pictures uh, linked to daily life. But uh, during the trip, we found the, the big part of the material that we found was found uh, close to um, a police station and a courthouse. And, and we found um, like 80% of this material is from a police uh, station. So it's criminal uh, material. Is, you, you can see uh, this part is families. It's, by, it's part of family's album. Well, go, go through it. Okay. Families. Okay, this part is, the, in this case, this is a, burn, a burned house. That this photograph, uh, we are sure that the photo was taken by police for photographer. As I said, 80% of the material is, is from police. So um, what what we decide to do in is to not to use our photograph, but to use the, this material to tell a story about the city of Detroit. Um, why? Because uh, we was in Detroit in 2009-2010 and, and trying to tell a story about uh, uh, the crisis that was beginning in the 70s. And this material is exactly of this period, from the 70s to the 90s. For, so this is the one reason, and one of the most strong reasons to use this material. This is inside the crisis and not after the crisis. But at the same time, this kind of picture, we found at the end 1,500 pictures and documents, and we, uh, we edit this picture and we collect more or less 200, 5,000 photographs. And what we did is uh, first use the material as a document, so we build an archive. And this book is, first of all, is an archive. But at the same time, as a photographers, we decide to use the material to tell a story. So we, we build a kind of storytelling with the, the picture that we found. And this is more or less the most important difference between a project when you um, take picture and a project when you found material. No? Yeah, the one important thing to say is that, um, of course, this is n not the, like, the story of Detroit. This is one of the things that we wa always want to make a point about it. It's just a part. We didn't find all the picture abandoned in the city or whatever, and at the same time was really important for us to have a part of the project that was more like daily life, families, schools, whatever. Everybody knows about this, the stories, Detroit, gangs, and uh, what's over, but uh, we tried it to be, you know, it was more like a percentage of material that we found. So the 80% was from the police station, so we decided to use it basically as an archive. Uh, sometimes we also had info on the picture, so we just use it as we found it. The, this, the book, which is this one, and the size of the book is actually pretty big, but just because the images inside have the same size of the original photos. Uh, the book uh, came after an exhibition, 
So the, the exhibition, which was at Le Bal space, uh, came first. And the wall was like this. So basically are the original picture framed, which was like a really normal frame here, as you see. And the book came after. So it's made about like 20 frame, and as you see, also we are trying to, you know, repeat the story as a photographer did in the past. What's important for us was that, as Luca was saying, this material was found and came directly from the people from Detroit. So it was something that we, as a photographer, can do in 2009 in our first travel. Of course, I mean, I'm sure everybody. So a lot of picture of abandoned houses in Detroit repeating, blah, blah, blah. And that's the case, and for sure, I mean, we took also our picture and they went really well, they sold them, whatever, but this was another thing. It was something different, where it was a, a different way to tell the same story at the end, no? So here you see the frame. So basically we made the exhibition and then we made the book, which was self-published. And then maybe we will talk a little bit about crowdfunding and how to produce a book by ourselves. So this, we distribute the books uh, through Cesura Publish. Actually the book uh, this year was uh, awarded, uh, I mean, was into the Martin Parr and Gary Badger uh, book, photo book a history, so, which was a really a good point for us because basically uh, as a collective it, it, you're not powerful as a, an editor, no? so you have to do a lot of work to uh, show your project around you know, and connect to the people and make them talk about it and whatever, so it was a good point this year for us. So then we made exhibition, we made a book, and now Luca and I are working, this is material that we, are, we didn't use, but we wanted to use, <laughs> so it's like, you know, every time we try to add the new pieces to exhibition. And then there is a third part, which is more connected to, has as a photographer and author, and uh, where we basically printed, this is just prints that we made, really big, take it from the series. So as you see, it's a project that started as a photography project. We were working on the economic crisis. We ends up in Detroit. Then we found this, we made a book, we made an exhibition, now we're making the print. So it's three different way to show your project around. Okay, good, good evening. Um, from our side, we are uh, gonna show uh, also a project that recently came out as a, as a book, as a, this book that we will show you also. Um, and this project is uh, it's one that it's made out of four different uh, kind of works that we made between 2007 and 2011 as a collective project. Uh, the project is called Four, Quattro, um, because we uh, connect it to the four elements. Each element is uh, a specific project uh, that we made uh, uh, during four years in four photographers. So there is this number four that comes pretty often. Uh, four years, four photographer, four little books. Uh, and the, uh, for example, we, now we are going to show you uh, the pictures that are inside the book. Uh, the first one that we made was done in 2007, and it's the chapter uh, on Earth. And it's about the uh, aftermaths of earthquakes in Italy. All the different projects are done in Italy, and they talk about the Italian landscape. So, for example, this first one, um, we made it, we started doing it in 2007, uh, and each of us visited uh, one or more areas that were affected by an earthquake in Italy. Uh, during the past years, could be 40 years before, 10 years before, uh, and so on. Several areas in Italy are, as you know, probably know, are being affected by strong earthquakes that caused uh, strong damages and many problems to the population. So we, we looked at the landscape and how it changed after an earthquake. 
here we are in Gibellina, for example, in, in Sicily, where uh, an earthquake of, in 1968 destroyed the town of Gibellina, that used to be where this giant sculpture is right now, and was rebuilt to a nearby area over the, uh, the hill. So the, we visited uh, five earthquakes areas, uh, also by adding, in 2009, uh, the earthquake in uh, L'Aquila. That was the last one we, we photographed. As you can see, the, uh, the kind of style of the images is very similar. Uh, all these pictures are made by one of us. We are four photographers. Uh, but we decide not to give, uh, let's say, not to give importance to the single person, but to add this fifth uh, photographer uh, that it's made, th that kind of creates the whole, the whole project. So we are not saying who is taking the picture, we are not putting the name of the photographers, but we created this a uh, collective kind of uh, v photography. Uh, and this is a very uh, important issue in our work. We were born, we started working together in, uh, in 2006 also for this, for creating these collective projects where uh, we all work together in the same, uh, on the same team. Uh, then, uh, of course, at the same time, each of us work on, on personal works. Uh, but during the years, we have created many different collective projects, pretty much one or two uh, every year, where we, we, de we develop this kind of, uh, of photography, where we, we choose to be, uh, we, we kind of give ourselves some rules when we are out taking pictures. And then when we go back uh, and look at the pictures, in this case, we look at contact sheets because this is a project that was it's been done in, in film uh, with medium format cameras. Uh, we also define even more this style, let's say, uh, from the edit. So we even give more uh, importance to it. The second chapter that we refer to fire, um, it's about the four Italian active volcanoes. So in this case, each of us went to one of the volcanoes that are active in Italy, so Etna, Vesuvio, Stromboli, and, uh, and Vulcano. And also uh, here, we kind of looked at the landscape, not only up on the, on the volcano, but also on what is around it, especially in areas like uh, Naples or Catania uh, that are really uh, populated around the, the volcano. The, um, the edit that you see here, uh, as I said before, it's the one we use it for the book. Uh, when we took the pictures back in 2007, 8 until 2011, uh, we also uh, took pictures of people. Uh, in, the, in the chapter of, of the earthquakes uh, and also in this chapter, there used to be also uh, pictures of people, portraits, uh, street scenes with people and so on. But we decided that uh, we, we wanted to, to create an edit for the book that was only of landscape. So we took out all the images where you could see a person. There, there's very few where maybe you can see one uh, very, very small. For example, like this one here. <laughs> then the third one that we made, I'm showing them chronologically as we, as we took the pictures. Uh, it's uh, water. Water is a, is a project we have done all around the Italian coastline during uh, two summers, each of us traveled to several uh, areas and we explore the, the coastline, taking pictures uh, mostly of what has been uh, created and made by man, starting from um, 
a, a report of, of, of an environmental uh, association from Italy, Lega Ambiente, uh, that was talking about what they called eco monsters, eco mostri. Uh, there are all those buildings that are probably um, out of law, uh, illegal, um, and there are something that it's really uh, strikes the the landscape of this of the coastline. So we started from that, but then we ended up just exploring all the coastline. We kind of did pretty much all the Italian coastline, uh, almost. Um, we not only took pictures of places that were illegal, but also uh, places that are totally legal, like, like this one here. Uh, it's an, an elevator in Ancona that connects the town to the, to the city beach. Um, but we, th this is totally legal, but it, it really has, as you, as you can see, it really has an impact on the, on the coast. You really see it from, from far, far away. Uh, and the same here. It's a, this is a museum, for example, but it has a, a strong impact as well. So this was really a project where uh, we started from a very journalistic uh, side, but then we ended up just exploring the territory even kind of slowly because we, we knew some areas we wanted to photograph but then the rest was done by just exploring the landscape and, and just finding, uh, even by, by surprise, certain areas. The last one, uh, it's air. And it, also this one came from, a, from an environmental report of, of Lega Ambiente that was stating uh, how are heavily polluted four Italian uh, cities that have a very big industrial zone connected to the town, very close to the city center. So we went to these four cities, Taranto, Gela, uh, Cremona and, and Trieste, and even here we, um, we took pictures uh, of the areas that were around, because of course we were not allowed to, to visit inside these industrial areas. Um, so we, we stayed outside and we took pictures of the landscape around these areas. So all these four projects, uh, while we were making them, uh, we were able to uh, publish them on magazines. We, all of us work either with the collective and also on our own with magazines in Italy and abroad. And we were able to, uh, to, to publish them uh, on some Italian magazines, also because they were uh, all self-produced. So during the years that we were producing the work, we, this was one of the output of this project. And as you can see, uh, there are not only uh, landscapes here, but also uh, there are pictures with people that didn't end up uh, in the book. So this, of course, on a magazine, it's a totally different output than a book. So the, the photo editor makes choices that are probably different than the one you would do. Uh, and of course, they use it many of the images um, with people in it. As Serena was saying, um, the ways of telling stories. So they went to Detroit, having bearing in mind a project, and they ended up doing something different. But they had also, they were following the same story at the end, right? So uh, ways of doing things uh, is also uh, what you have to keep in mind when you want to produce photography. So you have your own project and you uh, carry it on regardless of the sponsorship that you might get from a magazine and you know, a client. At the same time, you try to get, uh, you know, to sell your stories, to sell your photos. That's a way to, you know, to get funds to continue the project. Then another way of telling the same story is to do a different edit and make a book. So later maybe we can show you about this. But I just want to talk about the book, because then we'll go back to Cesura, on uh, why we decided to do a book like this and how this uh, worked out for us. So at the beginning, we uh, tried to meet some publishers, and the publisher had their own 
uh, designers, they have their own ideas, and at the end, we were not independent in making what we, we had in mind. So we decided to do a crowdfunding where we pre-sold uh, copies of the book, and this enabled us to collect enough money to go to the uh, printing house. And so with our own designer, our own art director, and uh, uh, the funds to pay for the prints, we printed what we had in mind. Um, so, Cezura have a similar uh, experience. They, uh, we used a, a crowdfund, crowdfunding platform which is called Produzioni dal Basso. It's an Italian one. Also because the book is uh, directed, let's say, to an Italian public, it's, it has text. So uh, when we decided to make a book, we also involved another collective, a collective of writers called Vuming. It's a group of four writers from Bologna. And uh, they, uh, they wrote this book where uh, each element, so air, water, fire, uh, earth, each element speaks. So in the case of the air, maybe hydrogen, helium, oxygen, the elements uh, that make air talk about uh, some topics. Um, so at, at the end, we produced photos you know, in a journalistic fashion, but then we made a book which is far from the journalistic classic essay. Um, and and Cesura can tell us about their experience in crowdfunding, which is a good way, which is a contemporary way, let's say, of uh, producing work. And then if you have questions about it later, we can also talk about it. So, yeah, it's, I mean, Rocco said everything, <laughs> basically. But it uh, was the same for us with Detroit. Actually, Detroit uh, came out not under a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, we found the money um, in, in different methods. But it was our first try. Yeah, we, uh, we decided, as Rocco was saying, if you go with the publisher, we have so much things you have to, you know, to do under its pressure, they have to sell the books and whatever, let's say Detroit, this book, uh, it, we, we actually had a really big publisher interested in, uh, in this project. We decided to go uh, on, on our way, which was more difficult at one point, but it's really a point of independency and trying to do what you really want to do. Also in this case, it's more imp important because they're not our picture, so if you let them, uh, them work on this picture with another person, then it changed. So basically you became the picture, the person that found the material and that's it, no? So, and let's, for example, this cover is really simple. There even are our name on it. If you put, uh, at the end of the, the book, there is these images of an American flag that seems like it's burning. If you, if you put it on the cover, it's more, it attracts more person <laughs> than this one. But it wasn't something that we wanted to do. So we decided to self-publish the book then uh, to continue also with our self-publishing house. Last, this year, we tried uh, Kickstarter, uh, which is another crowdfunding website. So yeah, uh, with this book that will come out hopefully <laughs> in not more than two months, which is uh, a book of Andy Rocchelli, one of the photographers of Cesura. And uh, it's a project made in Russia. It's a series of uh, women portrayed inside their houses. And uh, this project is interest interesting for us because Andy was, is actually, was actually a war photographer. So it was really like a photojournalist per, as, as his work was more on photojournalists than, than other. But with this project, the interesting part is this Andy was in Russia and uh, he started to take this picture to fundraise himself to stay in Russia to do a photo, uh, photojournalist project. Then he got passionate about it and he continued to do this project also because at the beginning the story under this project is uh, he was working for this agency that has a website where women can put their picture and trying to find a husband outside of Russia. So he was working for them and then he was getting the money and uh, he produced his own project in Russia with those money. Then he got passionate about it and he started to take pictures also of other women, uh, not only people that uh, were trying to found, find husband or whatever. and. Uh, and then he made he worked on the book. So then we made a, a Kickstarter campaign, 
uh, which went really well, and now we are working on the production of the book. And this this point of end doing this work, it's really connected for us at the end of the point of collectives and independency, uh, trying with you know all the efforts that you have and collaborating with other people, trying you know to put together all the forces and uh, work on what you really want to work so you don't have a compromise at the end. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please yeah. you know, feel free to ask. Um, I think we, we spoke quite a bit about independency and uh, you might wonder you know, how many of you have in mind the idea of uh, being a photographer uh, or a documentary photographer and so being independent is something that you might face uh, sooner or later in your career, linked to whatever client, whatever output you are seeking. Uh, for example, whether you're working for magazines or for NGOs which send you around the world and to document their activities, and you go there maybe uh, with your own uh, project in mind, and you might find that instead your project becomes their project, and Whatever, whoever is funding you has also some uh, r uh, say rights on deciding what you should work on. Um, so whether you're doing a book or uh, you, before the book you're, sh you're shooting, uh, you might uh, mm, have to compromise between uh, who is uh, behind that work and what you are, um, you know, what is your aim in trying to document a certain reality. Um, so I think this of the independence is something uh, that you, unites uh, uh, us, because we are here talking about many photographers also. Um, also, maybe there are also differences. Chizura, as they were telling you, uh, they have a bigger structure, like they have, I don't know, if you want to talk more about it. Uh, we as a project are just four photographers. We used to have a project manager, but now, now she left. So uh, we really uh, kind of do everything and sometimes we suffer from it. So being in a, inside a collective, it's not only uh, easy and honky-dory as you might think, say, oh yeah, let's, uh, let's not go with agencies. And also there you might uh, have to find a little compromise. For example, our archive is managed through an agency because otherwise you don't reach enough uh, clients in the other world. And so after a few years, we decided to give only certain uh, projects <coughs> and only you know, part of these uh, photos to uh, a big uh, agency. Uh, so let's say you, be, you are independent in uh, the new proje projects, but you are still keeping maybe uh, a foot in the big industry until this lasts. Uh, to try to uh, use it as much as you yeah. can. So, yeah. No, I mean, and it's actually the same for us. We, have, we are represent. I mean, we, there is an agency in Milan that sells our archive as well. And as Rocco was saying, our structure is a little bit bigger because we are five photographers that founded the collective and then we have people that collaborate with us. They come to our studio and let's say they do an internship and then they start to work uh, actually for the collective. So each of us, uh, take care of one of the branch of the studio. So, for example, I take care of the publishing house. Um, a good point that he was making that to work on a collective uh, is a really good opportunity. I mean, after six years, I'm still happy of my choice because, I mean, you have a really good um, confrontation. Uh, yeah, a relationship on whatever, every time we work on our picture, we, we share ideas, editing, we help each other. Let's say one of us is in, like two months ago, one of us was in Gaza, so we really help each other from here to there. But we, with everything, eh? with insurance, <laughs> tickets, selling the picture, with everything, but at the same time, to take care of a branch or, or, of a, or a part of a collective is really, taking time from you. So at one point it's like you have to, you share everything, but sometimes you feel like you have less time to work on your stuff, <laughs> no? So it's a compromise basically, no? Yeah, uh, just to add something, I think, I think it, this is really true from our experience. Uh, since we are just four, this, it's probably even more. And also the fact that um, on our collective project, we 
always work together in it since the beginning of the project, since the ideas to the uh, output that could be a publication, an exhibition, a book. Um, this really takes a lot of time because it's not just what you see from the outside, bit, but it's trying to market your projects, uh, trying to get in touch with people and waiting for their answers and, and so on. Uh, so really for, for the collective parts of our work that we do on a daily basis, this really uh, takes time and it's really uh, important to find uh, a, a good balance from your yeah work, the collective work, uh, and not having something that goes over the other. So it's, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, maybe one of the point on working like this is that uh, as a single photographer, you work just for yourself. As a group, you work for the group. So basically, you want the group to go there, not just one of us. It's just for us, it's like Chizura wants to go there. So all of us spend time like every day working on of stuff of the collective, but just because we want to, you know, get better all together, not just one of us. So it's the difference maybe between a single photographer that work for an agency and it's working for themselves mm -hmm. at home and <coughs> for a group of persons that decide to get together and do something bigger and different maybe, you know? We were saying at lunchtime, we were talking about this, and we um, agreed on the fact that friendship is a very important uh, base also for keeping a, a group like this going, because you might have you know, harsh time and difficulties in certain, in certain moments. So if there is something that glues the group, uh, which goes beyond the profession, naturally this is uh, important. For example, in the US, uh, one of the... Um, oldest, recent oldest uh, um, collective is Lucio, but we, uh, a couple of years ago, I think, half of the funding members uh, left, and by talking, some, some magazine interviewed a few of them, and they were saying that time management is the most uh, difficult uh, task when you are you know, in such a group, so as Ariana was saying, you know, this is uh, something you are facing every day, but again, if there is a common goal, which is let's go there together, and you know, a common base, which is friendship, you know, <coughs> these two elements naturally can be very important in keeping it uh, alive and going. Yeah, uh, because going. like in Lucio was a good example, because I really think that they changed a lot. I mean, if you lost one of the pillar of the, of, of the, the, the found member of whatever, then something changed. And like Lucio, I mean, two of them that were really taking a good part of, of the project left, three, three left. So, and now it's something different because it's changed. It's based, as Rocco was saying, friendship, let's have the same goal and whatever. So when something like that happened, it's, I mean, it, of course, it's going to change, no? Um, any questions? Question. Just a basic question. How do you find your project? Which is, where do you get your ideas? Uh, maybe this is something that can interest, you know, our students as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it depends. If we work on personal project or a common project or group project, whatever. Um, if we, like... Like there are projects we, we like to work in Italy, so sometimes, like right now, we are trying basically, okay, well, let's say, let's decide to work on a big project about Italy. So each of us, and maybe this is a difference between us and Terra project, actually shoot in a really different way. So we're not making, um, we, we do not have rules when we go out to shoot and this kind of stuff. Um, so we go for interest of a personal, I mean, of, of, a, of a, the single person. Um, we are really different. There is some of us that really works like, let's say, first line photographer, war photographer, and then maybe there is me or Luca. We, we work more on long-term project. But then we decide, like for the Italy project, we basically decide, okay, I'll do this, you will do that. But the idea comes out of interest of the person. And it comes out naturally most of the time. It's not like, okay, I want to work on this, let me check it out on Google. So, no. so it's more about, I really feel that I like this issue. And, and then we go with it. 
or, and of course, I mean, the base <coughs> of our collective is photojournalists. So let's say right now there is the big issue of immigration. So of course you maybe, you know, take some idea of, of what's going on right now in Italy or in the world. No, for us it's, it's similar in a way, because um, usually we, we start from ideas that I would say 80% of the time they come from Rocco, uh, who is the brain. Uh, but then when they get to me, 60% uh, of that 80% uh, get, now nah, somebody has done it already. No, but I don't think it's gonna work. And I'm the one who, who likes to criticize the uh, before, you know, not, not after, before. But then, you know, there's, some issues uh, that then we find a, a balance between the four and we say, okay, we, we do it. Uh, and yeah, like, like Ariana was saying, it's usually something that really interests us. So th there's not really a rule on certain issues we, we like to cover the most, but uh, for the first, yeah, and up until 2012, we, we only did collective projects in Italy. In 2012, we did our first project in, as a collective. They were all done abroad. Uh, so at first, we really uh, were interested and, and still are, I mean, on, on our country and to, to an exploration of our country under different uh, issues. So then, after after that happens, uh, we, we start really brainstorming. We decide who is gonna do what, and then little by little we try to see if we can find also finance for it. If we decide no, we really want to do it, even if any magazine is interested, nobody's interested, but we are. We decide okay, we do it on our own, and then we see after the project is done if there is uh, an output in a magazine or in, in something like that. I have a question for Ariana also. I, I'm curious. I think it would be interesting to know more about the Detroit pictures, how you found them, and whether you made any precautions not to have any legal problems by publishing them. And for Terra Project, I have a photo, a photo amateur question. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. Why are they all square? <laughs> we know you're joking. <laughs> so, no, uh, yeah, actually the, the laws between Italy and United States on found images are really different. So we went, we, we talked with a lawyer in New York and he's curating uh, the issue inside <coughs> our book. The only things that, uh, um, basically, the point is this one. Uh, the private picture is a different issue. Uh, you can use it uh, as a cultural uh, purpose. Uh, let's talk more about the police one, which is, you know, it's something that is an archive of the police, but the problem for the American law is that the material is of property of the city of Detroit. So um, let's say one person recognizes himself and sue us, the problem goes directly to the city of Detroit that didn't take care of the archive. And until we do a cultural use of the images, we are fine. What we mm, decided to do is to cover the sore name or phone numbers and to take out all the, we found a really a bunch of pictures about autopsy, a really cruel one, and we decided to not to use it. I mean, we, just because we don't need it, they were too much and didn't have anything more to the work. Thank you, Martin, for the question and for changing your question. Because the first uh, five years that we, we started working, Martin was always asking us who was shooting and who was focusing <laughs> you know, when we were taking uh, photos. So now there is a new question. I actually also do the game when I found uh, your picture around, it's like, let's see. Who did this? <laughs> who did that? <laughs> who did this? No, uh, actually, it's, it's a good question. The, the choice of the square format is part of the process of um, simplicity that we try as a um, group writing, as a collective writing to achieve in order to have four different people taking photos that somehow uh, are similar or homogeneous when they are put together. So it's one of those um, 
stylistic choices that are made, bearing in mind this uh, uh, fifth uh, photographer, which is the sum of the four of us. Hi. I have a question. You were talking before about crowdfunding and self-producing jobs, and you all do. And maybe, especially for students, that could be interesting. What's the kick with distribution when you do such a job? Because the big leverage that normally publishers have is about distribution. This is what makes it. Personally, I think it's becoming a false might because especially I've seen it in films when they start with crowdfunding and then if a job is well done and it works and your independence in a way pays back and distributors come. I just wanted to know what's, what's your, you know, in your experience, how is the, how is the relationship with distribution? How does that work for both of you? Thank you. No, for, for our book, actually, it was really not a big issue, the, the distribution, because of uh, we made 1,000 of these, and almost half of them were sold before they even came out, because they were the pre-sale that made uh, go to print for 1,000. Then after this, uh, since June up until today, we have already sold about... 300 more books on our own. So we do some presentation. We have an exhibition of this project that we did last year in Florence, but back then we didn't have the book, <laughs> even though we should have had it. Uh, and now we just did it in Vicenza, and we are trying to have it tour around Italy. Uh, the exhibition is made by the pictures and by some MP3 players where you can listen to the book uh, tales. So right now we are just distributing it uh, on our own through the exhibition and then we go to photo festivals where we make our little table and people come over and we sell it there. We make presentations of the book. We just made one at Martino's uh, some weeks ago. Uh, we will try to do other ones in, in other cities. And since it's a very small number, uh, we, we try to do as much as possible on our own. Also because if we give it, we, we gave it a few copies to a photo store, uh, photo book store in Milan. Maybe we'd do the same with one in Rome, but very few copies. Uh, also because they ask you for a um, part. For, they, they call it discount. Uh, I've never understood why they call it discount, but it's, that's another thing. But uh, they ask you at least 30% of the price that you make. So we, we decided also, for, let's say, for a political choice to have it a low price. You, you could buy this uh, on the, during the crowdfunding for 25 euros and now for 30. Um, that means we, we are making very little profit from, from each single copy. So if we also have to give some more money to a distributor, it, to me it doesn't make sense. So I prefer to maybe wait a little longer to finish them, uh, to finish them, and we keep something for us since we work on it for, <laughs> for a long time. And it, it's not gonna be profit anyway because we are four yeah. and, and then also there's internet where people can ask, the, we have a page on our website dedicated to the book, so you can go there, take a look at the video, you understand what it is and if you want it, we will ship it to you. Yeah, maybe I will add a point to it, like um, as he was saying, in this case there is a crowdfunding campaign on the back, so half of the book were pre sale on the on the crowdfunding campaign, and it's what happened also will happen also with our Russian interior book, the next one. Like for this one, we paid by ourselves for the production, and so maybe we we'll say, okay, let's say I make a book, and now, <laughs> and so basically the steps are few. It's like there are a couple of blogs around the world of people that write about books, like five of them really control the market of the book. So if he says that your book is good, <laughs> during the night you will continuously hear from your phone, dling, 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 <laughs> because you are selling, because he just said it, you know? So what we made was like, okay, we made 1,000 copies of the book. We decided that 
100 will go just to presents to this type of person, let's say curator, museum, blog, people that write about blog. And there are really few. So you send one to them as a present, just asking, let me know what you think about my book. And that's one point. And then you go into the circle of the 10 <coughs> best book of the year, all this kind of stuff. And does it, that it means that you are selling. And then there are uh, contests for book. Contests that pay to make the book and contests that pay for like the best book of the year. So you can take more money from them. And then, uh, of course, library, bookshops, festival, and website. Like from, we sell a lot from our website. So, but the, the, the things that uh, also, I mean, more if you go not under a crowdfunding campaign, it's really important to send the books to this type of person, you know, because it's the, the maybe they, then they write about their book and it's continually speaking about it, social network and whatever. I don't know if there are some students that may maybe yeah. have some you question, you know, some simple, simple question like, I want to be a photographer, I don't know how, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this kind of stuff. Because basically, as Cesura started when we went, end up our college period, so we were 21 and we ended up working for a photographer <laughs> and then we opened this studio together. So, you know, sometimes students are curious about how you can work it out after, you know schools and whatever. I mean, for us, I was saying before, uh, we started to work as a, for, a, for a Magnum photographer, he's our teacher, and we learn a lot from him, and it was a really good point for us to work as, a, uh, I was asking today <coughs> to Rocco, as you, say, as you translate Bottega in English, because, like, workshop. So, you really learn from him, like, day to day, but really from simple things that can be how to make expensive after a travel or uh, how to look at picture because I was really into Photoshop like 10 years ago and I was sure I'm, I'm good at Photoshop, you know. I'm really good, I went <laughs> there. And Alex is the type of person that uh, uh, teaches to us to do everything in the studio. So let's say we post-production the picture, we print the picture, we frame the picture with people around the the town, we really do everything in our studio. So he was printing, and he is a person that really wants so much from his picture, and he really know what he wants from his picture. So I remember that one day it was like I was working for him on post production, and he was showing to me the prints, the test. I was like, I don't know, can you see that it's blue? And I was like, I see it yellow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this is the point, when you learn from a person, you can really, you know, it's something that the school can give you, I think. It's something more. The school can give you a really good base, because I had, you know, I, I, I know how I, I to work as just a, a, a things of the high, in this case. But, so we started to work <coughs> for him, and then, um, we decided to put all of our efforts all together and open the studio. I think it's also interesting to know about, um, because Chizura, I think you, you add more people, in, and Terra Project has started with four and remained four. So how does the dynamics between the groups work? I mean, people leave, or you get new people coming in, yeah. and what it's, happens? Is it like a marriage? Is it like a marriage? You married for life? <laughs> it's not. It's happening the same that it happened with Alex and us. There are people as we 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 went to Alex's studio to learn, and people now is is coming to and asked to stay in our studio to learn. Uh, yeah, how it works, what we do, and the way we do the things that we do. So it's, it's a kind of you know everything is uh, is started from the master of Alex. This is, um, and this, uh, he he teach to Alex a way to to work and uh, and, and in, in some way a way to live, and because more or less for us it's the same because we live every 24 hours uh, together for five, from yes, five years. Point of Cesura, we have our studio really in the countryside of Piacenza, so we are kind of isolated from the city. It's like one hour and a half from Milan. And we live there all together. I mean, right now, after a couple of years, some of us, let's say the founder, started to rent some houses 
Not, not anymore in the studio, <laughs> you know. But uh, we have an house in the studio that, collaborate, that the collaborators can use, so we give a free house to them, and they come and they spend time with us, and it's a really a natural way to work. They come and they go, and sometimes they stay. It really, uh, yeah, it's just natural. And some of us just stay because maybe they start to work at the publishing part, so... And, so they work in, in, in that part of the studio and they stay. Some of us are just like three months, that's it, <coughs> I'm done. And we, are, we are really flexible. Let's say that the marriage is between the five of us that build this studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a few years ago we uh, looked into the possibility of getting someone else, especially not a man, in the collective. Uh, because most photo editors are women, and I remember uh, the first times that uh, we you know, took an appointment with photo editors in Milan, we would go, the four of us, with all our bags and computers and things, and this, you know, the reaction was like, oh, you know, one, two, three, four, and you know, where are, we don't have chairs. <laughs> like, this was the, the reaction. We don't have enough chairs for all of you. And then, why are you always men? Why are you... So we, we, we started thinking, you know, let's... let's uh, <laughs> look at portfolios, but then uh, we also realized that uh, we have this uh, uh, collective project uh, standard procedure that uh, we follow because we fit into it and getting someone else would be nice to maybe give a change, not to find someone else who does the same things that we do. And so at the end we didn't take anyone. It was the end of that. So it's gonna be a long marriage, yeah. forever, probably. Just as four men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's probably really, actually hard to find a new member. Also for us, I mean, like every year we do portfolio review, and every year we're like we didn't find anyone. So for us, because it's it's a point that you really have to get into the the, the style of of the studio, no? So it's not just you have a good project and you are into it. You really have to understand what we worked on on for yeah. six years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and this is kind of hard. So for us, it's more easier to have younger person inside the studio and to teach them the way how we work. And maybe one day, hopefully, some of them can be part of, of the studio as a photographer. So. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Also, the fact that that mindset of maybe you find one photographer that maybe did one good project and you you keep it w with you and you and make it become a member just maybe for one or two projects uh, it's more the mindset of an agency. <coughs> uh, the, a, a collective, it, it's something different, and you, you share uh, the the idea of of the collective. You share the let's see the the philosophy of it, and, and you don't only need to be a good photographer. So you, we, we are, of course, we are first. We are a person. So we, we even for us, that maybe will always be just four. Uh, even when we thought about uh, making the group bigger, we also talked, okay, we, of course we want somebody that is a good photographer, but we also want a good person, and to, to know a person you need time. So you can do like they do, and they can have people like collaborators for a while, being together, and then you, you know them. So that, that I think it's, a, it's a, actually a, a good idea because after you know them as person, you know they're good as photographer, they can fit in the group, then they can, they can become like a member or something like that. But yeah, that, that requires time for sure. Yeah, um, okay, sorry. Maybe this is a naive question, but is the money that you make, the profit from the books and stuff, is that enough to like make a living off of and fund all the traveling that you do? Or how do you get money for the traveling? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Very important also, probably the, the most important one. Um, we uh, have been working uh, as photographer, me and Rocco and Michael and Pietro as well, 
since about 2000, 2006, when we finished studying. Uh, and we are, we are all been working in the editorial market, so with magazines, uh, making assignments for them, and also uh, selling our own work that maybe we produced on our own. So this, this is a, a part of it, but this part is getting smaller and smaller and smaller every year, because the, the editorial market is really getting bad. We, we still are able to work to, to make assignments uh, from Italian magazine or from magazine abroad, but that's, of course, it's not enough to make a living. Uh, these two people have kids, they have, they have to raise their kids, so it's uh, everybody of us, all of us, they, we, we got expenses, like everyone. So of course, we, you have to f really find different kinds of uh, incomes. All, uh, uh, from my side, all from photography, but it could be teaching photography, making a workshop, uh, it could be doing uh, photos on a wedding, uh, or it could be pretty much anything, uh, but it's all about photography. So mostly, actually mostly of my income comes from, still comes uh, from the editorial market. Uh, it could be assignments or sales uh, on the archive. Rocco was talking about the archive before that we managed to sell to an agency. That is also an income, and that's a good income uh, if you sell it because you, you, you do nothing and you get some money every month coming. Then you, of course, you need to get paid, and that's another, another thing, because one, one big problem, it's not only how you make your money, but also how you get paid, because people are, especially here in Italy, are kind of slow in paying you, and you really need, and this is another job. Uh, you know, you know, you don't only need to think about projects, finding the money to do them, uh, finding the money to make a book or an exhibition, but then you need to find time to go after these people, you know, making emails, phone calls, why you haven't paid me, uh, please do it. Then you send a letter from a lawyer and maybe they pay you and it's like this, it's, uh, it's something normal, I would say, I'm sure it's the same for them. Um, but my idea is really to live on photography and I'm doing it right now, but of course the the time, it's really changing fast. So in five years or in 10 years, uh, I'm not sure what I, um, I would be doing. Uh, of I'm, I'm sure I'll be, doing, I'll be a photographer, but uh, probably the, the, it, it, it would be changed uh, also uh, fast. So um, w something that I always say to, to students or to people that are starting out, uh, even in the first classes of each course that I can teach, it's that it's really good if you can find uh, another job on the side. You could be a waiter. That's what I was doing at the at the beginning. You could be a waiter or anything, uh, and from that you make money to to work on your own project to develop your interest. Uh, I think it's very important, especially at the beginning, to think about what your interest in photography. So uh, develop your ideas and say, okay, I'm interested in social issues, now I wanna do fashion, now I want to do still lives or whatever. Uh, and you can only do that if, you, if your mind is free from other problems or, or anything. So if you do that, uh, if you have the money from another job, for example, and you put them in your uh, personal work, this is gonna help you more fast in developing a, a career or, or your uh, interest. Uh, but I find many, many young photographers, they really, they, and it was probably the same with us back then, but uh, they really struggle and they're like, no, I wanna get published on this magazine, I wanna publish this, publish that. And the project that they do, it's gather there, so to what a magazine could like. So what, what that magazine likes to publish? Uh, and so they make projects because a magazine could, could buy it. I yeah. think it's fine, we did it, we probably did the same, but then the, the fastest you learn 
how it is, the, the better it is for, for then your own work. Yeah, also because I think it, um, one point on what you are saying is that, I mean, when you're, I mean, first of all, it's a sacrifice at the, at the beginning. Mm. It's not really like, let's say, the idea of the, the romantic idea of mm. the photographer traveling around <laughs> the world. I don't think that that exists anymore, no, basically. No. But um, what is saying that maybe at the beginning your 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 point is to your goal is to publish on whatever, you know, on a magazine. But then it's a, a really risky cycle because if you get into the magazine uh, lifestyle and then it's like photo editors needs something. So at one point sometimes it happens that you're under like. I should shoot this because I'm sure that she's going to use it. And this is dangerous because it uh, disconnects you from what, what, what you really are, what type of photographer you are. So after maybe you work so much for two years for a magazine, and then what, what you have, project that you made for them, not a project that you made for you. So you, 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 you do not develop your own authorship, and this, I, find, I mean, at the beginning is normal, but at one point you really have to choose who you are and try to sell yourself, not what they want, no? Also, grants are becoming more and more popular and important for funding projects, uh, right? So, and I, th I think the key uh, <coughs> is to diversify also. Uh, yeah. your ways of obtaining funds. So not thinking only, oh, I have to sell to magazines, I have to, but I don't know, it might, might be useful also to learn how to use a, a video camera because, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, and, 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 you know, like learning all different things. Uh, for example, Simone started uh, editing movies and so he also started making short movies which can still you know, include his photographic style or even to, to make a nice slideshow, it can be important. So you learn little things that can help you packaging your work and uh, by doing this you can also open up new opportunities and so people see that you also make documentaries and uh, that's also... Um, re recently we also um, thought of doing interactive magazine. So with the help of a designer you say, okay, I want to talk about a specific topic which is too complex to do only with photos. So what can I put there? I can put photo, video, text, infographics, and I can put everything together inside a, uh, a magazine that you can read on the iPad. Um, so maybe there's not a big market for this right now, but if you become you know, more knowledgeable about it, then maybe in 10 years you can work in this area also. So it's also, it's always good to keep a, a goal, a target, which is, you know, my stylistic growth, uh, my projects, my uh, political ideas, but also, uh, you know, to look around and uh, see what is, what are the ways that you, that can help you to keep working and work more. <laughs> Just shortly a conclusion. Uh, you can. Uh, they will stay with us now. So if you want to have a one-to-one -one conversation with one of the photographers, we will have something to drink and and you can interact with them. It's always thank a, you for coming. It's always a collective. Uh, it's a collective. It's, it's yes. not a one-to-one. -one. Uh, well, a one-to-four <laughs> or one-to-two or whatever. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.